Um, cool. So welcome, everybody. Um, today's talk is rethinking the structure of event data. Uh, and I'll do a, a quick introduction uh, of myself before we before we jump in. Uh, so, as you can tell, uh, my name is Kara. Uh, I currently work as a product manager at Snowplow, uh, and I'm mainly focused on our trackers and data models. Uh, previously, I led Snowplow's implementation engineering team, and they're also uh, working on our, our trackers and data models, but more from a, a customer perspective, so helping our customers designing and implementing uh, both tracking and, and data models. Um, so, yeah, I've spent quite a few years in this, this area, um, and want to share a little bit with you today what I have learned in that time. And so just as a kind of quick introduction, um, most of this talk won't be super Snowplow focused, um, but I'll just give a quick introduction to Snowplow anyway, uh, so you have the, the full context. Uh, so Snowplow is an event data collection platform. Um, all of our core technology is available open source, uh, and we also have a commercial product called Snowplow Insights. Um, at the heart, uh, Snowplow allows companies to collect large amounts of event data um, from within their own cloud account in real time. And so we have a lot of different uh, tracking SDKs, whether it's web, JavaScript, uh, AMP, uh, mobile, iOS, Android, React Native, and then uh, a lot of server-side SDKs for all the common uh, server-side languages um, so that you can track data pretty much anywhere, send that through a pipeline, and then have that available uh, for analysis and visualization in a data warehouse where you can then plug in uh, BI tools of choice. Um, so as you can already tell, very horizontal platform, which is why we get to work with a, a huge variety of different companies and different industries, different business models um, on using this technology to build out their data capability. Um, and so, so why at Snowplow are we so excited <laughs> about the structure of event data? Um, so really it is because we work with companies across, across all verticals and business models. Um, and something that we have noticed over the years is that when companies want to capture large amounts of data, especially to, to maybe answer different use cases, to feed different applications, how that data is, is collected and how it is structured is absolutely crucial to success. Um, but before we, before we dive into that in more detail, uh, let's just quickly define what we mean by event data. So event data is, is data that captures each action a user or a service performs at a given time with the corresponding state. And so that can be a classic uh, web analytics event like a, a page view, but it could also be a user opening an email, a server submitting search results, someone channel, changing the channel on a smart TV, interacting in some way with a mobile app, or moving a position in a call center queue. So really all types of, of events can be captured uh, as long as they occur in a somewhat digital space. And so why is, why is the structure of event data important? Um, and I think here it's really important to think about why companies capture data. Companies capture data to derive actionable insights from it and ultimately to derive business value. And so in order to do that, we like to think there are three key factors that are really important for this. And the first is, um, that data has meaning, so that the business understands what their data means. The second is um, that there is high data quality, so the business trusts their data and therefore all of the insights and the actions that it derives from it. And lastly, um, there is data governance, so the business can control um, who can use what data, how data is being collected, who owns the data, etc. And so, for all of these, data structure is important. Um, and in order to look at that, we're gonna look at some common ways of structuring event data and how they relate to these three aspects that we've just discussed. So data meaning, data quality, and data governance. And um, for that purpose, let's consider a really simple example. Uh, so let's, let's uh, assume a user opens Twitter uh, and they see a post from Data Innovation Summit. Uh, and so they navigate to their profile and scroll through the posts, and then they see a post that they're interested in, and they like it. Really simple user journey, pretty, pretty easy to understand. And now, 
let's look at how that user journey would look like um, using data structured in different ways. And so the first one we'll consider is unstructured data. And just for simplicity here, on the left-hand side, I've got the timestamps and one identifier, in this case, the session ID, just passed out to kind of help us um, compare the different, the different types of, of data structures. But these could also be parts of, of the unstructured data. And so the idea with unstructured data is that you basically have a, a JSON object or similar where you can just put all the properties of the individual events that you want to capture. And so in this uh, case, for example, the first event that you want to capture is that, that screen view of the feed. Um, and so you might say the event is a screen view and the location is the feed. Um, when the user then um, sees a post, maybe a post from Data Innovation Summit, again, we can capture that with just all the properties that we might want to know, such as the ID of the post, the position of the post that is in the, the feed, um, the location where they're looking at the post, and, and in this case, the event is a, a post view. And um, I, won't, I won't bore you with going through all of these in detail, but you can kind of get the idea where here really, with this uh, concept of unstructured data, you can put in whatever properties are relevant uh, to, the, to the specific events. You can put in as many as you like, you can structure them however you like. Um, and so that, that's kind of the first type of data structure we will consider today. And so let's look at some of the benefits of this approach. And so the first one is that developers can really flexibly capture what data is available and required. Um, so as you saw in the example, they can just add in whatever, whatever they want to capture, given the event that is occurring and the, the people or the, the entities that are involved with that event. Second, it is really easy to add new information if the product or the requirements change. So if there was if Twitter introduced in the new concept of a category and all posts were filed under categories, then it would be really easy to add that. Um, or if there was any any other information you'd like to add. Uh, and then lastly, field names are descriptive because you're creating these field names on an event by event uh, basis. You can make them really descriptive, which is really great for an analyst because they can read the field name and they can actually understand what the field means. Um, so that's really great. However, now let's look some of the drawbacks. Uh, look at some of the drawbacks of this uh, approach. Um, so, in the first one is it can be a little bit difficult to maintain data quality, as information can be difficult to find if properties are named differently in different events. Uh, and so, to look at an example, maybe the the developer that does the post tracking um, is different to the developer that does the the tracking of the like button. Um, and so, maybe the post view the the ID is is uh, just called ID, but for the, the like button, if you want to, to make it more clear that this is the ID of the post, not of the like, um, they've called it post ID. Um, these two are the same, but they've got different names. That can be really hard to untangle once you've got that data in the data warehouse. Secondly, data needs to be explored and mapped before it can be loaded either into a relational database or before you can do any sort of dashboarding or, or visualizations or analysis really um, because you first need to discover what data is available in my unstructured uh, data objects. You don't really have a clear mapping beforehand. And then lastly, there's not really any governance on one for data consumers to say, well, actually, I need this data for my report, so please, can you put this in? Um, but also really for anybody to understand what data is being captured at the moment where, um, because it's, it's super, super flexible. So it's, it's not always clear what's, what's going on and where, where things are going. And so on the other extreme, that was kind of the very flexible one end of the, the spectrum of, of structuring data. On the other extreme, you have the concept of structuring data following a fixed schema. Uh, and so that's very common uh, among packaged analytics solutions, such as Google Analytics, where you have kind of a set number of columns that you can populate with the properties that you'd like to capture. Uh, and to look at an, an example of, or to look at our example in this scenario, so here we've got the exact same events that we had in the previous table, but now we've uh, structured this data following a fixed schema. Specifically, we've just gone with uh, a common way of, of naming these columns. So let's say we've got category action label property and value. Um, and we've got these fields available for us to populate with, with information. And so let's say for the, the category section, we pick a screen or post, depending on whether you're capturing a screen view or a post view. Um, the action is either a view or a like. Um, 
And then we're going to use the label to uh, determine the location. So if something's happening on the main feed, we'll call it feed. If uh, it's happening in someone's profile, we'll call it profile. Um, we'll then kind of use the property uh, column to capture any other information you want. Um, so with the post views, let's say we add the, the post IDs. Um, but when it's the screen view on a user profile, we also want to capture what, what user that was. So we'll use that column there. Um, and then the value can be the, the position um, at which the, the post was viewed in the feed um, or in the, in the profile uh, feed. Uh, and then maybe with the likes, we'll capture how many likes already exist uh, so that we can have that information uh, in relation to, to this event. And so here again, let's let's look some uh, look at some of the benefits that this kind of approach to structuring data has. Uh, and so the first one is that uh, the format of the data is highly expected, uh, and so therefore this data can be really easily loaded into a relational database. Um, you know what the columns are going to look like. You know what size the columns are. Super easy to load this data into a warehouse. The next is because you have a predefined structure, you only have so many columns there are. Um, it's quite easy to build dashboards and visualizations based on these columns because you know where they are, you know what they're called. Uh, it's quite easy to re reference them in a, in a dashboarding tool or in a data modeling tool. However, um, again, there's, there's some drawbacks. Uh, and the first would be it, it can be a little bit difficult to maintain data meaning as the same field will mean different things in different rows. And so, again, if we look at our example, the property field sometimes is, describes a, a post ID. Uh, sometimes is uh, the username. In, and the value field, sometimes it's the position in which the post was, sometimes it's the, the number of likes. So a little bit hard to figure out what these fields mean. In order to figure out what a field in a column means, you always have to check which row it is in. Um, next thing, it's a little bit difficult to add new information because there's a limited amount of, of fields available um, and there's not really anywhere to capture what a change in field means. So if let's say you, you previously used a column for um, a product that you no longer have, and now you want to start doing A-B tests, so now you're like, oh, great, we'll just use this column that we didn't, don't need anymore for, for A-B testing. There's no way to capture this change of, of what the data in that column means. And so it's a little bit hard for someone coming to, to the table later to understand what the data means in the different columns at different points in time. Uh, and then lastly, there's, again, not really much governance in the sense that you don't know whether required data will be captured. And there's also really no way to make sure that um, people will definitely be adding the right types in the right columns. So in our example, we said we're always going to use category for um, like the thing that is, is, is being considered, so whether it's the screen or the, uh, a post. Um, and we're going to use action for the, 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 the verb that people are doing, so like what, what are people doing uh, when they're interacting with that um, category item. And um, again, you ha you're kind of relying on people uh, uh, to adhere to those standards. There's no way for you to really ensure that. And so let, kind of having looked at both ends of that uh, spectrum, both the very unstructured approach and the very structured approach, um, let's look at what an ideal solution might look like. And so I think definitely something we'll want to keep is we want to maintain the flexibility of the unstructured approach. That was a really great aspect. Uh, so the ability to add as much as you want, wherever you want, be able to change things over time. We also probably want to achieve the predictability of the fixed approach. So it's really nice when you have a set number of columns to know exactly what columns you're going to have and what they're going to look like. That's really great. Um, we also want the field names to be descriptive. Um, so that consumers understand what the data means in the individual fields. Um, and we want that meaning to persist over time. Um, we also want a way for, for data consumers or, or anyone else who'll be, who'll be using that data to be able to enforce requirements for the data. So to be able to say, look, for a, a post view, I always need to have the post ID, otherwise it's pretty useless to, to have the, the post view event. Um, and then lastly, not only do we want it to, not only do we want it, people to be able to change what data they capture over time, but we also want to capture how that change is happening and maintain a, kind of a, a version history of all the changes so that at any given point in time when you look at data, if you look at data from two years ago, you know exactly what the data was structured at that point in time. 
not necessarily how the data is structured now. And so this is where uh, I will introduce the, the Igloo open source project. This is an open source project maintained by Snowplow. Uh, it's separate from, from the Snowplow uh, uh, main project, um, but it's a technology we use extensively, but also people use outside of the, the realm of Snowplow, because we think this is a technology that can help people navigate this balance between uh, the different ways of, of structuring event data. And so the Igloo is a machine readable uh, schema repository, uh, similar to uh, the, the Avro repositories that uh, from Confluent. Um, and it allows people to define uh, event structures using self-describing version schemas. Uh, these self-describing version schemas are then stored in a machine readable repository. Uh, and then your data pipeline can use these schemas uh, to validate the data and to load it into tidy tables. And so this is just an example of one of these uh, JSON schemas that uh, you, can, you can define. And so we'll just go through some aspects. Uh, so the first thing here is the, the dissection at the top that describes what this data structure means. So in, this is just one of the examples that, um, following that example that we've been, been looking at. Um, so let's say we're, we're tracking in Twitter. Um, the, so the vendor would be Twitter, the name of the event or the entity would be um, the screen, um, the format is the JSON schema and it's version one. So that describes what, what data are you capturing with these events. The next um, uh, are the properties. So here you can add all the properties that you would, uh, would like to capture. So let's say you want to, to capture the type of screen. Um, and so let's say this, the type of screen can only ever be feed or account. Um, and so you actually put it in as an enum uh, saying that this should only ever be a, a feeder account, or you could have a property that's just defined as a string with a max length. You can define these, these how you like. And then lastly, there's a section at the bottom that describes which of the properties in this schema are required um, and whether or not this schema will accept additional properties that aren't defined explicitly. And so let's look at what defining these data structures would look like in the translated into the actual data. So again, these are the same events that we have looked at in the previous two uh, data structures, uh, but now uh, follow using this kind of approach of, of defining data structures using self-describing schemas. Um, so for example, for the, the view event, um, we'll, we'll attach a screen object, uh, which is um, just has one property. As we saw in the, the previous slide, the um, type was the only required property. The other property was name. Uh, but that was optional, so we haven't included that at this point. But then later down in the line, when we do have, when we, the name is important, so when we're no longer on the home feed, um, but we're on a user profile feed, um, then we do want uh, the name to be captured there. And so this screen entity can be attached to all the different events so that we have this extra information for every single event, what screen this occurred on. Um, same with the, the post entity. So, um, here we, we have it available with every post view, um, and we're capturing the ID and the position. Here explicitly calling out the individual properties that we want to capture with these, with these events, um, and no longer having this issue of, of having to capture the same type of, um, using the same field for different types of data. So we explicitly can call out the, the post ID, um, the, the number of likes for a like event, um, and the screen name, and if it's a user profile, the profile name, all of these properties that we want to capture with events are specifically defined, um, in, but they are also expected because we've got, um, we've got that self-describing schema that describes what these data structures look like. And so going back to those ideal, that ideal solution we outlined, we can maintain the flexibility of the unstructured approach because you have to define these schemas, but you can define as many schemas as you like. You can order them as, uh, as you like. You can add as many properties as you like. Uh, you have full flexibility. Um, we've also got the predictability now because you've got a schema that describes what your data is going to look like. That schema can be read um, by your data pipeline, by your database loader, and can therefore um, gives you high predictability of exactly what the data is going to look like in the data warehouse. The fields are descriptive, and actually you can even in the schema add description fields to uh, every single property so that you know exactly what that property means and that anybody who comes to the table later can exactly understand what, what that data means.
Um, we've also uh, found a way to enforce um, what data is captured by making certain fields required. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how specifically at Snowplow we, we use the, the validation piece, um, but you can build that into any data pipeline you choose to, to link to Igloo. Um, and uh, then you can also change how, um, how you catch data over time because you've got the versioning as part of the schemas. And so we just um, recommend following semantic versioning. Uh, so having a major minor patch, uh, the, the three digits. So it's really easy to see this is uh, version one of the, the screen entity or version two or version 5.2, whatever it is. Um, it's, it's clearly captured and when the data is loaded, you can add the schema key so you know exactly this event was captured at this time against this schema version. So you've got full clarity um, of how the events have evolved over time. Um, and so that really shows that like how you structure your data is crucial in making sure that like everybody understands what the data means. The data is very high quality and you can enforce exactly how you're collecting data and, and why. Uh, and so let's look at how we use Igloo uh, as part of Snowplow, just so you can kind of see all of this in slightly less abstract terms and see how this actually works in, in practice. So again, going back to that very high level pipeline diagram we had at the beginning, Igloo kind of features in, in three parts of our pipeline. Um, and so first, obviously, it features in our tracking technology because we need to allow our trackers um, to specify these data structures so that they can then be uh, used later down in the pipeline. It features ob obviously in the validation piece where the data structures are actually used to check whether the data that comes through the pipeline is in the right format. And then it features in the data loading piece um, where our loaders check whether or not the, the data is in the right format and then load it into the columns or, or tables according to um, what, what schema they were sent with. And so just to actually look at this in practice, um, let's take a look at a, a simple example. Uh, so let's imagine our marketing team wants to better understand how the blog on our website performs. And so for that purpose, uh, we'll install the, the Snowplow JavaScript tracker on our website. Um, so it's just really simple JavaScript snippet that um, loads the, the JavaScript tracker from the CDN and then initializes the tracker. And when we're initializing the tracker, we just specify which, which Snowplow collector we want to send this to. This is just a demo one. Um, we'll, we'll make the app ID blog because we're going to be tracking the blog and then we're going to capture some information out of the box. This is uh, very Snowplow specific stuff, but just performance timing information. Maybe when you capture uh, anyone's GA cookies as well so that we can link any information we're getting from Snowplow to GA, uh, et cetera. Once we've initialized the, the tracker, we then want to start tracking page views. Um, so uh, we at Snowplow, we have this concept of activity tracking. So this sends a heartbeat every 10 seconds um, if the user is still engaged, so if they're still moving the mouse or scrolling. Um, so we want to initialize that before so that as soon as page uh, views fire, we also get some, some activity tracking. Um, but then we want to track the, the page view. Um, but with every page view, we really want to understand what article was viewed. And uh, for that purpose, uh, instead of just tracking the page view, we'll, we'll add the article entity. And so this is using one of these uh, self-describing schemas. So just in the tracking code, we'll specify which schema we want to use. So we want to use the article schema. Uh, and for that schema, um, we'll, we'll use the, the following properties. So the, that schema has a property called name, which is the name of the article, the author, date published, and the category that this blog was, was published under. So that's what we'll initialize. Obviously, these are just hard-coded variables. We'll have those as, as variables, for example, in our tag manager or however we are deploy deploying this tag. And then these events will be sent to the, the Snowplow pipeline. The Snowplow pipeline will then take this event and it will say, ah, it's a page view. I know how to map the page view. And then I can see here there's an article entity attached to this page view. I better go look and, and check if that's valid. So the pipeline will, will look up uh, the schema based on this schema key. And then it will find uh, a schema in the schema registry, hopefully, uh, that has a corresponding schema key. So that self section that we looked at before, um, those four properties should match the, the properties in the schema key. And so once it's found the schema, 
uh, it will then validate the individual fields. So say, yep, there's a name field, there's an author field, there's a, a date published field, there's a category, all the types maps, everything looks good. I can send the, the data on. If any events don't pass validation, the Snowplow pipeline uh, treats those as bad events, sends them to a separate event stream where they can be reprocessed and, um, and analyzed so that data isn't lost. Um, but the idea is that in the, in the good data stream of your data pipeline, you really only want the events that uh, pass validation so that if you build any downstream applications or any downstream data models, you can be sure that they're not going to break because there's not going to be data in there that doesn't match. Um, and so the validation piece is, is really important. And so then we, we have to load the data into the data warehouse. So depending on what data warehouse you're loading, you might want to structure your data a little bit different in practice. Uh, just because, for example, J uh, Redshift doesn't support JSON as nicely uh, natively as some of the other data warehouses. So uh, when we load uh, this kind of style structured data into Redshift, um, we actually shred out the separate uh, custom event and entities into separate tables. Um, so you have your main events table with all of the fields that we capture out of the box. Uh, and then we have uh, child tables for every custom event or, or entity. Uh, and then you have two columns that are the same in both, uh, kind of as the join keys. Um, so that would be for, for Redshift. Versus in, in Snowflake and BigQuery, we just append each custom event or entity as an additional column to the main events table uh, and load nested JSON into there because it's really easy to query that directly in, in databases like BigQuery or, or Snowflake. And so then once you've got that data in your data warehouse, you probably want to model this data. Um, and so here, just looking at some really simple questions that we can answer and showing how easy it is to answer these type of questions if you have data that's nicely structured in the way that we've discussed. Um, and so, for example, let's say our marketing team is really interested in which blog category is the most popular blog category. And then, so the SQL for that would actually be really easy to write because all you would need to do is use that category field in the article entity and count the number of page views for that category. Um, and so this is actually the, the syntax for Redshift. So you can see there's the, the join from the child table to the main events table. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's a really simple count to, to get that information because you know exactly what column the category field will always be in. Um, and you know the category, the article will be attached to every page view that is an article view. And so it's really easy to get that information out of your data warehouse. Another question you might want to answer is saying, you know, how long does the average user spend reading articles? Um, how, or like any given individual article? So then again, that's, that's pretty simple. This is now using the, the Snowflake uh, SQL syntax just so you can see the, the difference. Um, so we'll just capture for each page view that is an, an article view, uh, we'll capture the, the article name, maybe the date published so we can order them nicely at the end. And then the, the number of page uh, pings or heartbeats that we had for that uh, giving an article view, we'll group those and then we'll just select the average. So again, really, really simple. Again, because we know exactly where that information lives, we know that that's gonna be unique so that that same column isn't gonna be accidentally used for something else at the same time. And so it's again, it's very easy to retrieve that information. And so hopefully what, what you can see here is that well-structured data makes analysis easy. Um, and therefore really allows you to get insights from that data much faster. And whether you're using Snowplow or any other, any other uh, data collection method, whether you've built your own data pipeline, whether you're using our open source or whether you're using a different package analytics solution, thinking about how you're structuring that data um, can be really, really crucial in making sure that like the data that you collect is easy to access for your analysts, easy uh, to build, um, explores or dashboards for that you can socialize across your organization because that's really what allows you to build a, a data informed culture where everyone in the organization can quickly understand what data means quickly find where it is and then quickly use it to answer the questions that they have if you do want to play with a, a sample of snowplow data similar to the the data i've just shown uh, you can download a sample here i will pop it into the uh, chat um, the link because I'm not sure you guys can, can click on it in here and um, if you want to just have a play around you can just download the data there's no need to sign up or anything um, it's it's just a simple download um, if you are, are interested um, and otherwise 
uh, there is now time for questions. So let me let me check the chat. Um, and yeah, feel free to, to continue adding questions if you have some. Um, I'll take a, a moment break here. Awesome. So I, I can see a, a question from uh, Winston uh, saying the event data shown is actually considered um, under structure or more commonly semi-structured. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the, the question there. So if you if you could elaborate on that one in the in the chat, that would um, uh, be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, if you are referring to the fact that the JSON, the un what I called unstructured data, JSON is actually structured, um, you are correct. Um, it's just unstructured in the sense that like, it's very hard for an analyst. Let's say you have a, a pipeline that just creates unstructured JSON and then just loads that as is into one column. Let's say you're using Snowflake um, into one column of nested JSON. Then it's unstructured in the sense that like, as an analyst, I don't know what that data contains. I have to explore that. And un unless I'm using some sort of schema inference tool, uh, like I know AWS provides provides tooling in that area and, and other cloud providers do too. Um, you, can't, um, you can't exactly know what's gonna be in the data without um, doing that exploration first. So you can enforce structure because obviously JSON is structured in the sense that it's organized. It's not just like plain text, um, but it's not, um, it's not easily structured for analysis in a relational database. Um, so the next question is uh, Francisca asking whether I recommend uh, BigQuery, Snowflake, um, whether I, recommend, I would recommend BigQuery and Snowflake over Redshift. Um, I think this is a really interesting question um, and, dep and depends really heavily on what you're, what you're doing with the, the different data warehouses. Um, so Redshift is, is really easy in terms of you pay for your cluster, and if you just need a single node, for example, that's a fixed cost, and then you can you just have that cluster all, all the time, and you don't really need to worry about how much you're gonna use it. Um, so it's very kind of low maintenance from that perspective. Um, however, because they don't decouple the storage and compute uh, costs, if you have a lot of data, that can get really expensive really quickly. Uh, so then solutions like BigQuery and Snowflake become a little bit more favorable where you can actually store, like store data at a very low cost and then only pay for how much you're querying it. Um, but again, that requires a little bit more thought into how you're gonna structure your data, not just from like a raw data perspective, but also from a modeling perspective. So how aggregated do you want to save the data to make sure that when people are querying it, for example, via a BI tool like Looker, they're not racking up huge bills because they're scanning that same raw data again and again and again. Um, so I would say like for, for smaller data volumes, Redshift is a great place to start, but at large data volumes, Snowflake and, and BigQuery can be great uh, because they just give you more flexibility on the performance of, of queries um, than, than something where the, the compute and the storage costs are combined. Um, Awesome. Yeah, and I think um, we can follow up with some more information on that one as well, because it's a very big topic. Uh, lots of lots of different opinions about which one is is better. But yeah, I, I can't say one or the other distinctively. Um, um, so there's some questions around the difference between uh, our schema versioning format uh, and, and Avro schema versioning. It is very similar. Um, so uh, before, when we developed Igloo's schema registry technology about five or six years ago, um, ma the main inspiration was, was Avro's, uh, the Avro schema versioning and the, the way Avro schemas are structured. Um, Igloo Central is a little bit more flexible in the way um, it captures the versioning. Uh, it's a little bit more flexible in the way it can be integrated into data pipelines. Uh, so Avro tends to, the, the way the Avro schema technology works is it tends to assume you have one schema registry that you link to your pipeline versus with, with Igloo, you can have multiple ones and the way we use Igloo at Snowplan means that's beneficial. Um, but I guess the, the general point is like the 
conceptually, it's very similar to the Abru uh, schema versioning technology. Uh, practically implemented, it's a little bit different um, and it's more optimized to integrating it into a, a Snowplow pipeline. Um, then there's one question, what do you think of copying the Google Analytics data and send a copy to Snowplow? Is it worth the extra effort to create a specific Snowplow event instead? That is a very good question. Um, so Snowplow does have a GA plugin that allows you to take all of the, um, the data that you're sending to GA and send it unsampled to a Snowplow pipeline. Um, we have seen some adoption of this in the open source community. Um, however, we do recommend, this is a great thing to test out Snowplow and to see what it's like to have the raw data without having to pay for GA360 and to just see what, what raw data you would get, what the numbers look like when you're not being sampled, etc. cetera. Um, however, the data structure of Google is very much optimized for Google's uh, UI and reporting suite. Um, and I think this is a, a kind of a more general point. Snowplow, because it is just a data collection tool, is really focused on structuring the data in the best possible way, versus a lot of other partly data collection tools like GA or Adobe or Heap, um, they collect data for the purpose of using it in their UI, and then they just happen to also offer a data export. And so when you get the data out of these tools, it's a really weird format because it's made to be optimized for their reporting. And so it becomes really hard to use. So if you use the Snowplow GA plugin and send all of your GA events to Snowplow like that, you'll get all the raw data, but it'll be structured kind of funkily because it's structured how GA provides it. Versus if you were instrument Snowplow natively, and again, it's it's not actually that much effort because as you can see, like just getting heartbeats and scroll depth and page views is actually just a few lines of, of, of JavaScript you'll get much more detailed events, you'll get um, them in a much better format to work with, you'll be able to write really simple queries to aggregate this data. Um, so I think that, again, the GA plugin is better used as like a, a, to start off with and to just see what it's, what the Snowplow data would be like. We wouldn't recommend using that long-term, probably. Uh, another question. Hi, can you clarify how you can combine event data from various sources where the property, label, and values may be different, but you would still want to store all together and query the total? Um, so if I understand this, this question correctly, you always have this uh, trade-off between the more you standardize the way you structure your data, so you have fixed sets of columns, the easier it is um, to, to look at all of the, the different uh, data together and like make analysis of across kind of, for example, across the user journey, across different sessions, et cetera, because you have it all in the same place. Um, and this is kind of the approach we've also tried to go at Snowplow. So having this kind of one table approach, even if in Redshift, it's only conceptually one table, practically it's multiple tables. Um, so I think you can, you can keep that approach of having everything in one place without having to have it in exactly the same columns. Because I think, and, and anybody who's written data models before um, can understand this. If you're trying to write a data model, when you have the same column mean multiple different things in different rows, it's really hard because you end up with an insane number of case statements where you're trying to say, okay, well, if this field is this, then this means that. And if this field is this, then this means that. And then if anybody changes something in the tracking that you're not aware of, loads of your case statements might break and might start including data that isn't meant to be included because of the way it's, um, because you have to be in a way like exhaustive in all of your definitions of what a field means where, and with a growing number of different events, being exhaustive in your in your SQL becomes really, really hard. Um, and so I think when you're trying to, to capture data from lots of different places in one common place, the overall format can be the same. So for example, if you want to capture things like the tracker version or the timestamp or the user ID, that can be the same for every event. But the fields that are specific to the event or the specific to the platform, they have to be separate columns in the data warehouse. Otherwise, it just becomes impossible to, to keep track of what anything means and therefore make sure that when you're reporting these numbers out, you're not accidentally mixing stuff together that isn't, isn't meant to be mixed together. Um, 
Awesome. I, I hope that answers your, your questions. If anyone has asked a question and you feel like I've misunderstood your question or not answered your question properly, uh, feel free to ask again. Also, uh, feel free to, to message me after and I can, I can take a look at them again in more, more detail. Um, I see there's a, another question. What do you recommend for people, organization, just getting started with a, a tracking design? That is a very good question. Um, and I think actually when, whenever we get started with, with tracking implementations, the thing that we favor is an iterative approach. Because we, we favor technology that ensures that if you make changes over time, nothing will break because we have versioning in our, our data structures. We have the freedom of starting with tracking something and then see what data we capture from that, see how we can use that data, see what's missing, track a little bit more. We can go with that approach because we have the flexibility of changing our setup over time really easily and really clearly. Um, and so we would always recommend that, like think about the five questions that you cannot answer that you really need to answer and implement the minimum amount of tracking that you need to answer those questions. Then go back and say, well, what have I learned now? What new, what extra information would I need to capture to be able to expand on my initial analysis, to be able to expand on my initial reporting? And then extend out the, the tracking um, to incorporate these. These kind of mammoth tracking designs that have like every possible action on a website or every possible thing someone can do in a mobile app. Um, they often just end up to, with a lot of confusion. You end up capturing loads of data that you never use. Nobody really understands what anything means anymore because there's just so much uh, coming in, lots of similar things, but a little bit different. So I think really taking iterative approach, focusing on the, the core things that are important to your business, getting those right first, and then keep adding until you're at a place where you say, now we have a really comprehensive understanding of what is going on in our digital products. I think would always be favorable to, to trying to capture everything at once and then figure out what you need of that later uh, because that later never comes and then you've just got loads of data that you're paying for being processed, paying for storing in your in your data warehouse um, and everything is quite convoluted and it's really hard to, to understand how to how to use the data and what it's being used for. Awesome. Uh, is there any other questions? Cool. Um, doesn't look like it if I can see from the chat. So as, um, as promised, uh, I can add here uh, the link. If you want to uh, explore um, some data structured like this by yourself, um, here is a link to, to do that. Um, and also, if there is a blog post version of this um, of this talk on our website, if you want to read through anything again, if you thought anything was unclear and you'd like to just get a little bit more information, uh, feel free to take a look at this. Um, and yeah, any anybody else who has any questions, anybody who thinks of any questions uh, in a few days, uh, feel free to email me. My email is down on the screen. Uh, feel free to to reach out to me on on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and thank you very much for joining. It's been an, an absolute pleasure and I hope this was useful for you. Thank you.